Welcome to the Orthodontics and Summary Podcast, where Farouk brings you the key points and understanding of orthodontic webinars, conferences, and papers in a concise podcast with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Hello, all, and welcome to this episode. Today, we're having a look at the lecture entitled Class 2 and Growth Modulation, So Near and So Far. This is the lecture by Nicholas Vade. Nicholas described how the changes in the literature has shaped our clinical practice. He then went on to describe the answers that we have now in 2020. And this is part one. The first question was, do we have the evidence and is it effective for treating class two cases? The first part of this was to look at phase one treatment or early treatment. And that's been shown through a Cochrane review by Harrison in 2007 that early treatment offers no advantage, no clinically different outcomes when compared to delayed or later on treatment. The next question about an increased overjet and trauma. Well, there is a relationship between the two. And we know that for an overjet greater than three millimeters, there's twice the likelihood of a patient experiencing trauma. And that was a systematic review by Nigan in 1999. Giannelli also showed that there's a 10% increase in trauma for patients if they don't have phase 1 carried out. Now, the conclusion to this question is a statement by Jay Bowman from 2006, where he said that just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it for every patient. The next question, is growth something that we can predict? Well, we know the effects of a functional appliance do not offer any restraining effects on the maxilla and do encourage a growth of the mandible. That's both in the AP direction, but also vertically. And that was Mills's paper from 1991. Now, how does that growth take place? Well, we know there can be up to three millimeters of change in respect to the mandible from Pagonian to Gonian. SMB can change up to four degrees. However, the growth that takes place naturally is over a prolonged period, as Bishra showed in 2000. And the answer to the question is that no, we can't predict growth, but we anticipate some growth occurring, although it will be small. Question four, when should we carry out class two correction and which appliance should we use? Well, the when, we know that there's a CVM changes, cervical vertebral maturation. And between stages three and four is when the peak height velocity occurs. However, Nikolaj explored this and stated that only 25% of patients actually have a single peak when it comes to their growth. Most patients having multiple ones, which makes the process unpredictable as to when this is going to occur. As far as which one, well, the efficiency has been looked at within the literature, and it shows that the HERPS, or the fixed functional, is the most efficient at 0.28 millimeters of changes that take place. A twin block not far behind at 0.23 millimeters. And we appreciate that fixed functionals have an advantage over the removable appliances. And this was looked at in Nicholas Vade's own systematic review in 2014. Question five, what changes do take place? Well, Nicholas said not all appliances work the same way. Removable appliances, they mostly achieve correction through distalization or distal tipping of the upper posterior teeth. And the upper incisors are uprighted. Whereas for fixed appliances, most of it occurs through molar distalization. But this time an increase can take place in Pagonian to Gonian, which is significantly different. Question six, do they grow mandibles? Well, the conclusion to this question was a statement from the AAO Council in 2005, which stated that there's no scientific evidence that, in, that a functional appliance can increase the mandibular length. But he explored this further, so some evidence states that there is lengthening that takes place of the condyle and the ramus. There's remodeling that takes place in the glenoid fossa. But actually, these changes that take place are insignificant to the overall length, as Johnson showed. Johnson showed. And also, the change that takes place of the condyle can't be permanently increased as well. Now, question seven was that does headgear still have a role in the class two correction? Well, there's evidence that states that there are vertical and AP changes that are significant after six months of use with 500 grams per side. That's by Burke in, 2000, uh, in 1992 and Nanda in 2006. However, the compliance of headgear is low. And Brandio showed that of 50% that, that patients are compliant. Now, the conclusion to the use of headgear, I think, is a wonderful statement that Nicholas said by Clone. 
the person who was responsible for the clone bow. And he was asked that, do, does he still use headgear in his own clinical practice? And he said, well, yes, I do use it in my practice, but my patients don't. Moving on to question eight. Are fixed functional appliances effective? Well, Nicholas stated that compliance is near to 100% as possible. And the advantages are that phase one, or the functional appliance stage, is reducing its length, with the force of appliance achieving an average of 4.5 months for this. Now, there's different types of fixed functional appliances. The forces has been compared to the power scope. And it showed that the forces appliance actually has greater skeletal changes that take place. And that was Aurora's paper from 2018. And this new concept of a fixed functional is starting to utilize with other innovations, such as using it with TADs and mini plates. I'm looking forward to seeing the evidence that comes out about this. That's it for this side of part one. Look forward to part two coming out soon and concluding Nicholas Raid's lecture. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.